growing up in a Jewish family, I've got to say that I was not aware at all of the spiritual world. Uh, I was, I grew up culturally Jewish, but certainly I did not understand anything in terms of um, the spirit of God nor the spirit of Hasatan, the devil. Um, it just was all not real. And when I accepted to the Lord, it took me a while to change. In fact, I would say even being a believer for some, getting close to 60 years, um, that some things I still struggle with because of my upbringing. And so I think it's important to make sure we look at our upbringings and we see what things we've learned that God wants us to unlearn. And, what, and, and so we're going to talk, we're going to continue this discussion about spiritual warfare and prayer because for me, this is, this is like, in some ways, unbelievable. And I'd like to start with Luke 22, 40 through 45. Because I figure if we can see how Yeshua reacted, then it's going to be pretty good for us as well. And so it says, when he reached the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not enter t into temptation. So this is Yeshua speaking to the disciples. So what kind of temptation? They're, they're out alone. They're, I mean, what, what's going to happen? And he pulled back about a stone's throw from them. So it's interesting. He pulled away from them. He wanted to pray alone. He didn't want them there. And he, he's on his knees, because you remember, he's young, right? He's, he's around 33. People still could get on their knees at 33. So you don't have to do everything he says. And this is why, by the way, it's where two or more are together in prayer. There one can get lifted up. This is very important if you're on your knees. But it says, he speaks to the Father, and he says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. I think this is important because we see the reality of prayer right there. Yeshua is saying to the Father, it's your will, but I'd prefer not to do this. But, in other words, make your will my will. And, obviously, that happens. Um, it says then, now an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. So there was an angel sent to, to lift him up, to strengthen him, to get him to be able to deal with what's about to happen. And here's the word I'd like you to consider. And in his anguish. So what does anguish mean? It's a suffering, it's a struggle. So Yeshua was struggling. And he was praying fervently. Now, if he was praying fervently here, it's likely he was not praying fervently when he first got on his knees and spoke to the Father, probably because he already knew 
that that particular prayer was not getting answered the way he wanted it to get answered. So it was kind of a sheepish prayer. <laughs> you know, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this out there, but I know that's, it's not going to work. And so now Yeshua is dealing with reality in the spiritual realm. And so he's in anguish. He's praying fervently. It's not a rote prayer. It's not a prayer that he's probably ever said before. But he, however, he, whatever he was saying, it was intense. It was fervent. And all of a sudden, the, the one who really could do anything and everything was intense in his prayer. Intense, fervently. So much so, his sweat was like drops of blood falling down on the ground. So, when you see people praying fervently and you're not used to it, as we like to say here, Get over it. Not because you have to do it, but because the person is having a special time with God. And they're at the point where things are getting fervent. They're getting intense. And that might make some of us feel uncomfortable. And that's okay. It's okay to feel uncomfortable. And it's okay to have intense prayer. I don't expect that anybody should run from the synagogue because of intense prayer. I think I've seen a few people do that. But I don't expect it because I think we have to understand that there are different times, different seasons, different situations. And we have to be respectful of those. Not diminishing what other people do. And when he rose up from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them asleep, exhausted from grief. It is my belief that that is where they got tempted and that is where they sinned. They went to sleep. And in this case, sleep was a sin. Because they were so exhausted from their grief. See, it's all about them at this point. <laughs> and, and so it's, it's about their grief. And what God wants us to know, that it's about Yeshua. And... And even though he's finished with the, the anguish and, the, and the, the thought of crucifixion and, and what was going to, the very painful death that he was going to experience, which he already knew, it should have been, the disciples should have been all over him trying to encourage him and strengthen him. But even at that point, they were thinking about themselves. And it really didn't stop until the power of God's Spirit came into them. So there are people who, are, who have learned from an early age that the, that the spiritual realm is not really it's not really real. And that hurts our faith. That hurts our prayer life. That hurts our energy. And as I said, to some extent, I'm still trying to get over it, though my head understands what I believe God's trying to say, and my heart understands it, there's some sort of cultural stuff that is hard to get rid of. 
It's just really hard. And so one of the things that most of you know that I do is I write down things for myself so I can do better. Better in my prayer life, better in, in my relationship with the Lord. Because that's how I feel I can overcome. Uh, because when I do things off the top of my head, it, it just sort of, uh, it doesn't work. It, and I get distracted, and, I, it, it, and it, I get into areas that are not fruitful. So I wrote what I'm calling my Elul prayer. It's based on some other things that other people have written, but I've reworked all of that because I wanted it to be for me. And for me, it's easy, or relatively easy, to do these things because I know what I want to say. It's just when I'm put on the spot and I'm ready to pray and nothing's in front of me, I sometimes just... It just doesn't happen. So, in your bulletin today, you've gotten my little prayer. And I want to go over some parts of it, because I think they are biblical in terms of how we are to approach prayer, and that we are to approach prayer. I believe, and I can't tell you that I'm, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I believe that half of our congregation does not pray daily. Yeah, in, in a organized fashion. And I would say that's true of every church you go to, every synagogue you go to, uh, Messianic. Um, I believe that there are a lot of people who are who have the heart to do it, but they don't feel they have the time to do it. And I believe that they get distracted and things get in their way, and once the day begins, it's like a snowball going downhill. <laughs> There's no stopping it. It just keeps going and going, which is why I believe we should get with the Lord in the morning, whatever hour that requires. So, I believe that one of the things I, I will take from Sam's playbook about praising God, I believe that that's how we start in prayer, because that puts us into the presence of God. It takes our mind off of ourselves, and it puts our mind on God and who he is, and what he has done, and his characteristics. There is, for me, for me, there is no scripture more powerful in this area than Psalm 145, verses 1 through 13. So I'd like to read a little of it. In fact, I'd like you to read with me. So why don't we read right now, uh, to verse 6, 1 through 6. You'll see it up there. You can also, you have it at your, uh, if, you, if it's not too dark for you, you can read. Okay. I will exalt you, my God, the King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is Adonai, and greatly to be praised. Your greatness is unsearchable. One generation will praise your works to another and declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and your wonders. They will speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will proclaim your greatness. Okay, so let's stop there. First of all, I don't believe that it is reasonable to say those words in a monotone voice. Regardless of how self, uh, how, how you see yourself, 
whether it's timid or whatever words you would use, I feel that when, when we speak to one another, we determine whether we are being honest with one another based on how we say things, not just the words we say. And I believe it would be true for God as well. More important than whether it's true for God, is it true for you? That you need to be expressive. And again, you're not used to it. I can say in my synagogue growing up, there was very little expressiveness. And so I challenge myself when I'm reading this at home, when I'm walking and reading this, which I love to do, uh, outside and, and just really, I just have a sense of the awe that I should have for God. And so that puts me in a place where I'm ready to pray. Because I have a concept now of who God is. I have a concept of what he does, and I have a concept of what he, how amazing God is. So for those reasons, I start out, and oftentimes I will stick to Psalm 145, because there are different scriptures that do a beautiful job of praising God, but it, they last like two verses, three verses, and all of a sudden you're somewhere else. And I just needed to focus. And this 1 through 13 focuses on God. And that's what I need. So if, you, if you're looking at your booklet, you can open it up. Uh, if not, we'll have it up here. My Elul prayer. So for those of you who are new, Elul is the month that we are in. I've asked people to pray and fast during this month of Elul. It's the sixth month of the year on the Hebrew calendar. Elul means to search, and we are to search in our hearts to see who we are, what, what God wants to transform in us so that we can be holy because we are to be holy as he is holy. So the prayer that is written here is one that, as I said, I've taken it from a number of prayers as well as my own. And uh, so let's look at the first paragraph, which is your first slide. And again, would you read it with me, please? Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, I come to you in the name of Yeshua, and I ask you to forgive me for anything I have done that could displease you in any way. I ask you to cover me and cleanse me with the blood of Yeshua and fill me to overflowing with your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit. Okay, so the next step in prayer each day, I believe, is to ask God to forgive us. And you can go to other things where you can forgive others and so on. I, I didn't really do that in this one. I've done it in other prayers. But, um, but certainly what you want to do is because since man wrote this, meaning me, you don't necessarily, not all of it's for you. And there are things at certain times you want to add. Do not wait, because while you're thinking about it, that's the time to do it. So as an example, I ask you to forgive me for anything I've done that could displease you, and I'm sure that one of the things is if I haven't forgiven others. And so if there's anybody, bring that person to mind. So, you know, and then you go off on that, but then you go back. When you realize that you've, you're, you're, you're getting distracted, you go back to the prayer written and 
you, you, now there are different things that you can do. For instance, you know, when it says cleanse me, I immediately go to Psalm 51. You know, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a... So I might just recite that scripture right then and there. So, honestly, to get through these two pages can take me 45 minutes to an hour. Because the prayer is not only a prayer, but it is also a stepping stone to other areas that once I get started and I get on a roll, I can pray on my own. I don't need this. I need it to get me back on track, and I need it to start me going. But once I start going, I, there are a number of things that I want to pray for, and this is reminding me of having a clean heart. This is reminding me of, and, and different scriptures remind me of other scriptures. So, you know, you have to then pray those. Or it could be a word, just one word. And, and you want to picture this. You know, what does it look like when I'm asking God to cover me with the blood of Messiah? Now, to people who are not believers, they're thinking that that is pretty yucky. But to people who are believers and understand the power of the blood and, and the features of the blood, that this is an important concept to be covered. It's like Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, Day of Covering. We're being covered and cleansed. Let's go to the second paragraph. Cause my thoughts to be your thoughts, my desires your desires, my will your will, and put a guard across my mouth that I can say no more or no less than you would have me say. Keep me on the path that you have laid out for me today and show me Hasatan's tactics in advance. Yeah, because Lord, I, I want discernment. I need to have discernment to see what is a, a trick of the enemy to get me to do things that I shouldn't be doing. I think of a recent conversation that potentially could have been extremely hot, and I could have either blown up or said things that I shouldn't have said, and I, I, not that I'm congratulating myself, but you know, when it happens so infrequently that you do it right, you know, you have to say, you know, that, okay, God's getting to you, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and so I, I really sensed the power of God keeping me on track and, and realizing what his will was for that conversation. And now that's a whole new way of living. Forget praying. It's a whole different way of living because it's the acknowledgement of God being there at all times, which is what really prayer is. Sometimes it's said out loud. Sometimes it's said in your spirit. Sometimes, you know, so that we, we have to just enjoy the wonders of God and what he's trying to do. Once we start to categorize things and put things in a box, we kind of get legalistic. We end up doing things by rote, and we lose its meaning. We have to keep our relationship with God fresh. We have to keep it on fire. And, and so in so. As I'm saying, so this is, I mean, I know it's re relatively long, but it is still not meant to be your Bible. It's meant to just get you going so that you can pray with fire, with intensity. And there are things that I can tell you I'm in anguish about. <laughs> You know, I, I can share that with Yeshua. There, there are definitely things. And for that, I need to pray intensely. 
Now listen to what I just said. For that, I need to pray intensely. Does that mean for other things I don't need to pray intensely? We are scary people. I just want to tell you, it is not easy. I don't know how God puts up with us. It, it, is, it is difficult, but we, if, if we just rest in the Lord, you know, it's that combination of humility and boldness. We need both, and we need to attack Scripture with that same kind of boldness and then humility, and to realize that that we're on a journey. And so this is part of the journey. My little prayer is a journey for me. So then, of course, in, in verse, uh, I'm sorry, in, in the third paragraph, which probably will be two slides up there, I want to put on the armor of God. And so I pray that every thought that Hasatan tries to put in my mind will be repelled by my helmet of salvation. And I am wearing the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth is around my waist. Now, I bet many of you have read that often. But I would ask you, what is the breastplate of righteousness? So a breastplate is that covering. It's like a shield, right? And it's covering. It's covering attacks. Because guess when we are not righteous? When we're hurt. And so this breastplate of righteousness is making sure that what is, is being aimed at us, we are... We are wearing that righteousness, and the righteousness is pushing aside our hurt. It's more important to be righteous, going back to uh, some, uh, a message of four months ago about our core values. Our core value is to be righteous. We don't have a core value to allow hurt to control our being, because then it gets ugly. But righteousness brings beauty. Righteousness is integrity. It brings honesty. And so I'm wearing this breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth. How many know it's easy to lie? And I guess from a spiritual point of view, God has seen our lies. Nobody else is because we don't share our lies with anybody. But when we're in a situation, all of a sudden we feel like we have to say something or enlarge something. Yes, that's a lie. When we know that it shouldn't be enlarged. But we're trying to make a point. We're trying to win somebody over. So it's okay if we say something that isn't true. Yeah. God would be playing an interesting joke if what was tied around our waist would fall down every time it wasn't a truth. <laughs> and my feet are ready with the good news of shalom. So we're ready to share our faith at all times. Then it says, I take up the shield of faith with which I will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Faith has to be the key element to everything we do. Whether we love, it's by faith. <laughs> because how many of you can love people you dislike? Very few. But by faith, in the God who says we are to love unconditionally, we are able to love.
But it's by faith that we do that. And faith is, it's one thing to have the breastplate of righteousness kind of helping you with, with oncoming stuff, but the shield of faith is able to extinguish, which means these flaming arrows are coming and, and they just sort of drop before they hit you. That's faith. Now, I will tell you that faith is under attack. It's, a, it's under attack in Israel. It's under attack in this country. And it's under attack in so strongly that sometimes you feel foolish to have faith because people make fun of you. They talk about your crutch. They talk about all sorts of things, which gives you that sense of... But you know what? Faith is what we need the most of. It is the critical piece to loving God, loving our neighbor, and living a life of abundance. It is all about faith. And so we have to realize that when we are dealing with faith, it is our lifeblood. It is the key issue. And so I take up the shield of faith, which I will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. I ready myself with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, that's what Yeshua used, right? He was tempted three times by Hasatan in the desert. And three times he came back with the word of God. The word of God is our sword. It, it is an offensive weapon that gets rid of Hasatan. It gets rid, uh, and we need, to, we need to put gobs and gobs and gobs of God's word into our spirit, into our mind, into our heart. Because that is what's going to send Hasatan packing. And we will be able to go through the storms of life with joy as God commands. It's a commandment to rejoice. And we will be able to do that because of the word of God is so strongly in us. That nothing will be able to overcome us because the spirit realm is stronger than the physical. Now, how does a Jewish boy get to that point? I don't know. I, I would just say that God is working in me in a lot of ways, and I, I almost sometimes want to say, God, why have you waited this long? <laughs> because there's some things that I'm seeing and understanding that are more today than even yesterday. But I think that's what it means when it says, seek the Lord. Because when you seek the Lord and you realize Yeshua is the word made flesh, that this is where God wants us to be. I'm not going to do the entire little prayer with you. Otherwise, we will be here an hour or an hour and a half more. But I would just say that I'm trying to explain to you how I use it. So you can see that even in the third paragraph when I'm talking about putting on the armor, I can't just read it. I have to decipher it. I have to understand it. I have to, and it's different a lot of the time. I might skip one of the things and then go to something where, where it seems like God is showing me today 
this is what I really need to focus on in this area, whether it be faith or whether it be the word of God or, or whatever it should be. God has to be so real in our life that it feels like he is standing with us right now or sitting with us. And that happens through God's word. It happens through prayer. It happens through allowing God to work in you, not to make another rule, but to work in you in such a way that you have the freedom to enjoy him at all times. You have the freedom to do things in a very structured way or a loose way. But the results have to be a nearness to God. And you have to find out what works for you. Because what works for me might not work for you. But the goal has to be the same. Ah, the word goal. What am I thinking of? Just, just thought I'd play this game. Um, goal. When you think of the word goal, what scripture? I think of Philippians 3. You know, where we are to press on to the goal in Messiah Yeshua. Forgetting what lies behind, which is not easy for a Jewish boy, but, you know, I'm working on it. For, forgetting what lies behind, moving forward to the onward call of Messiah Yeshua. That's our goal. That's our goal. And, and so God wants to interrupt what we're doing, what we've planned, to show that he wants to put emphasis on a certain word, thought, idea, so that you will carry that around with you, and you will feel refreshed and renewed each and every day. Okay, let me just mention two other things and we'll close. On the back of this, um, it says, Knowing who I am in the Lord and knowing my purpose will keep me rejoicing in the Lord. So I have some scriptures there that I think would be good for that. Not all scriptures. I didn't put, you know, uh, Philippians there, which I probably should have. But there's only so much space you get on a card. And then uh, finally, at the end, you want to give thanks. You want to give thanks. Now, that might sound like praise, and it might sound like giving thanks, but either way, uh, you end praising God or giving thanks. And so the scriptures, I, I love First Chronicles 29, 10 through 13. And also Colossians 3, 16 and 17. So why don't you read these two? Do I have these on here? I don't know. I don't think I have those. Well, if you have your card, you can read with me, if it's light enough. Um, so First Chronicles 29, 10 through 13. See, light. Join with me. Blessed are you, Adonai, God of Israel, our Father, from eternity to eternity, your Zadonai is the greatness, the power, and the splendor, and the victory, and the majesty. Indeed, everything in heaven and earth, yours is the kingdom, Adonai, and you are exalted above all. Both riches and honor come from you. You rule over everything. In your hand is power and might, and it lies in your hand to magnify and give strength to all. Now, my God, I give you thanks and praise your glorious name. So that's one, and then 
Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Let the word of Messiah dwell in me richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with gratitude in my heart to God. And whatever I do in word or deed, I do all in the name of the Lord Yeshua, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Lord, I just thank you and praise you for your word. It is so encouraging. It is so inspiring. And it's so life-producing. And I ask, O oh Lord, that each person today would just have some time and tomorrow and the next day with you in such a way that it would just light up their world and that you would be the source of that light and your word which you have said will accomplish what you've set it out to do it will not return void and so lord S accomplish it in my life, accomplish it in their life to have great joy, to, great, uh, to have great purpose in you for your kingdom, that you will be glorified in everything we do. I thank you and praise you in the name of Yeshua. Amen.